You hear about the history of concurrency. And so uh, without further ado, let's jump right into it. So the first thing you probably need to do is define what is concurrency, and maybe even more importantly, uh, why is it important? Why should we care? Um, so concurrency is the composition of independently executing tasks. Um, so a couple examples, if you've used uh, like Redis, this is just some little sample Python code, but hopefully anybody can kind of understand what's going on here. Uh, basically what's going on is, is we have some database and we get a connection to it and that's the client. And then we uh, increment, we get a key from the database. And then we increment uh, a counter on that value that we got back. And so these are dependent tasks. Because we uh, have to get foreign key one before we know what key to increment, those two tasks are dependent. You can't run them at the same time. You have to wait for this first one to finish before you can do that second one. Uh, so independent tasks, on the other hand, would be something along the lines of incrementing two totally different counters. Um, just this code alone, those two tasks are completely concurrent in the uh, fact that they're independent from one another, even though that they're not, they are not written to run concurrently. So if you wanted to write two tasks to run concurrently, I cheated and just use a different language, Go, where you have a handy little Go keyword that just does it all for you. Um, so in this example, I'm sorry, that, that text really didn't show up. Well, um, some random web address is what's there. But the point being is that these two tasks are not only independent of one another, because they don't rely on one another in any way, but because of this fancy little Go keyword in the language Go, uh, they run concurrently, meaning that they can execute at the same time, they can execute uh, in backwards order, just completely independently of one another. So parallelism is different. Parallelism, on the other hand, is the simultaneous execution of multiple tasks. Uh, the tasks might be related, they might not, but all that matters to be parallel is that they're actually happening at the same point in time. Um, so you can think about it this way to kind of clear up concurrency versus parallelism, because I, I don't want to mess with semantics too much, but it is a key thing to know uh, how to differentiate. Um, concurrency is a structural property of your code. You can write code and you can say this code is, is written to be concurrent. Um, like in those examples, when it had that Go keyword, that code is written to be concurrent. That Python code, uh, where the tasks were independent, wasn't concurrent code. There was nothing in there making those run at the same time or allowing that to even occur. Uh, concurrent tasks might be executed in parallel, might not be. Because parallelism, on the other hand, is a runtime property. You can't look at a piece of code and know that it's parallel. You can know that it's concurrent, but you have to look at that code actually running. You have to pull up top or H top or system monitor or whatever. You can like, see the little CPU graphs going up for both cores at once. That's parallelism, is when it's a runtime property of your code as it's executed. Uh, so this talk is mainly going to deal with concurrency because it is the building block that allows parallelism to happen. Uh, so why does concurrency matter? And this is the old argument uh, that uh, you know parallelism is important because we're getting millions and zillions of cores and everything from our computers to our phones, right? Like we need to learn how to write code that's able to run in parallel. And uh, in order to do that, you need to know how to write concurrent code. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that's hard for humans. It's pretty easy for computers to run things in parallel these days. Uh, it's really hard for us humans to reason about things running in parallel. We are really good at focusing on a single task and only worrying about that single task at once. We're really easy about, we're really good at reasoning about what you know a certain task is going to take us toward in the future. Um, it's kind of like, you know, if somebody throws a ball at you, you have some idea that it's traveling at you, and you can track it and catch it just fine. If people throw, like, three balls at you, you can, like, try to track each one independently, but it's really hard to track all three at the same time. So it's just really hard for humans, and so we need really clever uh, tools to help us deal with this. 
Um, yeah, so why should we learn about it? The thousands of cores argument. I, I put that in quotes because like the, the I heard people talking about that like in 2008, you know, in like just, just a few years we're gonna have thousands of cores. And it's a few years now since 2008. And we still don't really have thousands of cores for anybody on normal hardware, but we have more cores, and we're gonna get more cores. It's gonna be more gradual, I think, than people thought, but uh, but it's definitely coming. Um, and uh, we just need to, I think, I, I'm the son of two history teachers, and so for me, like, just <laughs> learning from, you know, the people who have come before is kind of, I enjoy it. So thank you for suffering along with, uh, through this with me. Um, so this isn't a hardware talk. Oh my gosh, like, that is such a huge area between, like, GPUs and CPU, multi-core CPUs and cache lines and memory buses, and I would love to hear these talks. Like, there's tons of exciting hardware to talk. I don't know any of that stuff. Um, the one piece of hardware I will briefly mention, though, is this really cool transputer, Atari made one. Uh, there were a few other made. And the reason why this is so cool is because it was back in the 80s, and back then they had a very similar problem to we, that we hit in the mid-2000s where people were like, oh my gosh, we can't make CPUs any faster. You know, we hit like, three point something gigahertz, and it's like, that's that's it. We've just got to add more cores to speed things up. Uh, and they actually hit that back in the 80s around, you know, like the 20 megahertz range, and people were we're never going to be able to break this barrier. Like, we've got to figure out some other way. And so the transputer was that, where it had uh, individual cards that were essentially independent computers. Um, and you would just slap another card into your computer to speed it up, and it would do more work in parallel. The downside being it took a special programming language and operating system and cost thousands and thousands of dollars more than any competitors, and so it never got on at all. But it was a really cool idea. And we'll actually get more into what it did later. This is in the distributed systems talk. Also, super cool stuff. Uh, Plan 9 is an operating system built to be distributed. This is the last that you'll hear of it. Go to the left hand side. The language built uh, with concurrency in the core. That's what this talk is about. Uh, and so the history of concurrency basically boils down to it was all invented in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, uh, so let's just run through the terms really quickly. Um, way back in the 60s, we had things like continuations that we'll get into first. 62 is when we actually first had the first computer that can do more than one thing at a time, um, really in a very rudimentary way, but still a big advancement. Uh, that improved throughout the 60s. In 65, so, uh, Dijkstra? Shouldn't have even tried to pronounce his name. <laughs> but uh, in 1965, he invented both mutexes and semaphores, which are just kind of the foundational pieces of a lot of modern concurrency programming. Um, two different papers, he just kind of, you know, invented most of what we use today. Uh, <laughs> 68, Algol, is, there was actually, I believe, a really funny uh, blog post when Go, the language first came out, comparing it to Algol 68's features, because Algol 68 actually built in these, like, a uh, parallel keyword and uh, uh, other keywords specifically for concurrency. So these aren't new ideas or features in language. Like, we've had these since well, before I was born. Um, in the 70s, compare and swap in hardware, that allows for a bunch more or a bunch easier concurrency primitives to be created. I don't even know how they did some of these earlier things without that. Uh, Unix pipes get really interesting because they actually allow multiple processes to cooperate around sharing information. Um, actor model, concurrent sequential processes, all in the 70s. All these other, like what we consider fairly high level, sophisticated kind of models uh, came out in the 70s. And so that's the end of concurrency history, right? Like this is, <laughs> this is all we have today was invented here, basically. Uh, and even all the wars that we battle today have like been fought and won before. Like the whole like threads versus like invented systems. There was a paper on that in 1979, uh, and it, it outlined the duality argument, which was that effectively both threaded systems and async, evented, whatever you want to call them systems, can be written in one another's terms and are not just effectively equivalent, but the performance is actually equivalent if you implement both systems. So, um, lots of hand-waving and caveats around implementation details there. But, uh, but even this war was fought and won long, long ago. 
or fun to be a draw, I guess. Uh, so this begs the question, though. Like I mentioned, threads, but in the big long list. I mean, I don't mention threads on here anywhere. So, like, when were they invented? When did this become thing? Obviously, before 1978 or 79. That's when the war was fought and, and settled over whether they were a good idea or not. Um, and so to really answer this question, uh, we need to figure out exactly what we mean when we say threats. Luckily, Wikipedia is here for us. Uh, this is one of the worst diagrams I have ever seen. Uh, you have a, a process as a petri dish, and threads are bacteria that are traveling south. I don't really know what this is supposed to mean, but I just couldn't pass up put it on here. Um, it, is, it is really complicated stuff to try to reason about and think through. Remember, humans not so good at this stuff. So let's break it down into three concepts first about concurrency. Uh, the first concept being knowing what I mean when I say things about primitives versus models. So in programming, uh, we have a bunch of primitives, things like uh, all the basic constructs of your language, like functions and objects, uh, basic statements. Um, these are the most basic building blocks of your language. You combine all of them together into design patterns, larger patterns, um, and then at the highest kind of level of abstraction, uh, we have this thing called models, which kind of bundles all these together into uh, kind of the frameworks of the programming world. So uh, primitives would be things like processes are primitive. It's kind of like the basic unit of applications and the operating system. Threads are a primitive. Uh, they're a basic unit of concurrency. Um, semaphores, mutexes, those basic locks that uh, languages use. Uh, monitors, coroutines, continuations, all of these things are very basic primitive building blocks that when languages have them are exposed in very simple built-in ways. Uh, so some patterns would be things like event loops and dispatching I.O. to event loops, thread pools that handle I.O. are kind of a common pattern, uh, using queues to kind of buffer things and pass variables around inside an application, that's a design pattern. Whereas models are these things uh, like the actor model, which I'll get into more detail later, and CSP, which is what the transputer was built on it. We'll get into more detail about those later. Um, but for now, the key is that models evolve into primitives over time. So while all those uh, things were listed as being invented in the 60s and 70s, and that's all great and fine, it takes a really long time for them to show up in languages. And it takes even longer for us to learn how to combine them in novel ways to produce these very high-level models. And then once we learn how to use them all together in high-level models, how do you make those models something very simple to use correctly? And so you kind of have, it's not just an evolution from models and primitives, but it's kind of this feedback loop where you build models out of these primitives and then slowly you get new languages that turn these complex models into something built in and very simple and easy to use. So, uh, one example of this is uh, monitors, which, I don't know, I, I don't even really run into them much anymore, but they're a basic building block in, in so many languages and, and programming styles, but we don't have to worry about them very much uh, these days. But, but basically, what a monitor is, is it's a special type of lock around an object. Um, and it's, it's a primitive built into languages like Java, it's been there since almost forever in Java. Um, but it's actually built up of three different primitives. It's a mutex, a condition variable, and object. And so once these three things were invented, people started combining them in ways and started coming up with a design pattern and then started coming up with uh, um, you know, this more sophisticated combination to uh, create a locking around using an object safely that then finally got built into languages as mo uh, monitors as just a built-in primitive that these days, I don't, we don't hardly have to think about them. Really very way into the book. Um, so this is just an example of kind of that evolutionary process. Uh, some more examples of this evolutionary process is if Go exposes that CSP, um, 
as primitives. That's what the, the Go keyword, spinning up uh, uh, coroutines, and then it has channels built in, and we'll define some of these things in more detail later. Um, Dart and Rust are new languages that expose message passing as primitives. Uh, instead of having to use libraries that implement a uh, large model, they just build these ideas right in. Julia, likewise, just provides insanely sophisticated parallel and distributed programming concepts, just as primitive within the language, you can just use it right away. Um, and Erlang is really the one that did evolve back in the 80s and is still going strong today. Uh, so before we get into more details on those guys, let's get to the second concept task schedule. Uh, so we have, um, if, if concurrency deals with multiple independently executing tasks, uh, how do we know when the task runs? Who decides that? How do we control this? There are two basic modes for deciding this. Uh, there's the preemptive scheduling and cooperative scheduling. Um, the main difference is that cooperative means uh, one process task call it tasks, because all of these terms are so overloaded. But one task decides when another task will run. They do it cooperatively. There's some explicit call made to say, okay, I'm done working, now you go. Whereas preemptive, that's like applications on your computer. That's threads, that's uh, modern OSs and things like that, where uh, the, the OS just seamlessly switches CPU time between all your different processes and threads. You don't even notice when it switches out one for the other. Um, and it just preempts one line, one program right in the middle of what it's doing to run a different one. Um, Go routines and Go are an example of this. They were actually cooperative up until the 1.2 version of Go, which is kind of an interesting aside. Likewise, Erlang has this idea of processes that are fully preemptive, but likewise also weren't until very recently. And so I, I mention that mainly to say that there's an evolution that takes place in these things too, where things that start out being cooperative systems uh, often add other features later and vice versa. Uh, Unix signals I highlight because they're kind of this weird, interesting case of even if you write just a simple script, no threading, nothing special in it. Unix signals happen preemptively. And so at any point in the simplest of little scripts, the Unix signal can come in and completely make your beautiful, serial, little application uh, just jump to a completely different place in the code. Um, they're usually handled in very straightforward, simple ways, like closing your application. Uh, but they are an interesting case of how even in the simplest of applications, there's this weird preemption that can happen at any um, callbacks, coroutines, fibers, and uh, Ruby and lots of other languages, the brain threads if you've used uh, Gevent or something like that in the Python world, those are all cooperative. At some point, uh, something is explicitly uh, handing control over to something else, whether it's a callback and node that goes back to the main event loop to give somebody else control, or whether it's a, uh, a fiber in, in Ruby saying, okay, it's safe to switch to a different fiber. Um, so cooperative concurrency, just breaking into a little more detail on these, continuations and coroutines are very interesting kind of building blocks uh, that we often don't have to worry about, again, directly these days very much. They're just kind of uh, aspects or features of the languages that we use. Continuations are kind of the most basic one, which uh, they're uh, just a uh, subroutine or function that has the ability to save and resume its execution state. So this is like a yield keyword in a language often, will uh, allow some sort of basic continuation behavior where at some point that function can yield control, the uh, runtime OS, something knows how to leave that alone and then go run something else. Um, so you, some languages that don't have this built in natively can kind of do it with closures and classes and things. Uh, and so it's, it's an interesting thing, but since it's primitive, but can be very hard to kind of implement if it's not native. Coroutines kind of build upon this, and uh, generators, that yield statement I was saying, are, are actually um, a type of coroutine, uh, because they allow two functions kind of work in tandem with one another, where one can yield back to the other one, and uh, and then at some point be resumed again. Um, 
The implicit versus explicit is kind of key here, because depending on the language or framework or libraries that you use, um, you might have to explicitly use a yield keyword, or it might just happen behind the scenes when you do special things, like I.O., for example, like you write to a network something or write to a file. Your language or runtime might do cooperative task switching in the background for you without you even realizing it. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, but sometimes you do have to think about it. Like in the example of callbacks, it's like this very explicit sort of, okay, here is what I want you to run in the future when something happens. That's explicit cooperative programming. The real downside here is one uncooperative thread in the abstract sense, one uncooperative task uh, can cause a deadlock. If it just spins in a loop forever and never yields, uh, your program is done. It's, it's never going to make it out of there. Um, and so CPU bound tasks can be really tricky. <coughs> I.O. is the easy place to switch between one task and another. Um, it's possible, and you can do it, it's just trickier. And then language support pairs. Uh, preemptive concurrency, on the other hand, um, it was a core feature of Unix from the beginning and, and stolen from Multics even before that. Uh, Windows 95 and NT were the first versions of Windows to have preemptive processes. Uh, Mac OS didn't gain it until OS X. Um, and it was a core feature of good old Amiga back in the 80s. Uh, so it's, it, it was a little surprising to me that the ability for one process to just kind of steal the CPU and never give it back was actually pretty common up until recent history. Um, preemptive threading, on the other hand, so a smaller unit of concurrency, uh, is, is in many ways even newer. So Layers in the Unix world had it back in 93. But Linux didn't really have preemptive threading built into the kernel until 2004. It kind of faked it before that. Um, and so implementations of this in the OS are more modern than I kind of ever expected, especially judging that Unix kind of had it uh, for processes way back in the 60s. Um, and so some modern examples of task scheduling at work in kind of novel ways. Go and Erlang actually have these small tasks, Go routine and Go a process in Erlang that don't actually map directly to operating system threads or processes. Uh, you can have a thousand Go routines and only one operating system thread. You can have a thousand Erlang processes and only one operating system process. And both Go and Erlang take care of scheduling all of those tasks uh, onto those for you as part of the language, as part of the runtime, as part of the virtual machine. Um, Rust took an interesting approach where it's very configurable. You can kind of plug different backends into it. So you can have this hybrid end-to-end -end threading um, or a lot of other things. And I don't know if that's fully baked yet in Rust, but, uh, but it's a very interesting direction. Java, Script, and Dart are cooperative only. No preemption at work there. Uh, and most modern languages are preemptive with libraries to kind of add cooperative behavior to them. We'll kind of list some of those later. But let's get on to the uh, third and final concept here to get through, which is methods of interaction. Uh, if your tasks are independent, at some point they need to communicate, right? Otherwise they would just be separate programs or on separate computers and you, you wouldn't even care about whether you're writing concurrent code or not. So if you're in the same program, you probably want them to communicate at some point and not be totally independent of one another. This is where things get really messy. Uh, the two, once again, we have two diametrically opposed kind of approaches to this. Uh, shared memory and message passing. Um, shared memory is where your tasks just share memory space. And so if one has access to a variable, the other one can just change that variable up underneath it. And so synchronization is key. Uh, you have to coordinate with locks. Uh, mutex is in locks. You have to coordinate with semaphores. You have to use these monitors um, to make sure that only one thread is accessing an object at a time. Uh, whereas on the, uh, the other end of the spectrum is message passing. Uh, message passing uses communication instead of sharing. So instead of two tasks just sharing a global variable and changing it out from one another, or hopefully using a lock to do that safely, uh, message passing uses things like queues or signals or channels to safely send data from one task to the other. There's lots of implementation details there to be 
Uh, so one example of message passing is, is in this actor model that I mentioned earlier. Uh, actors are the concurrency primitive um, in the actor model. That's why it's named after them. They're kind of the star. Um, actors and stuff. Sorry. Uh, that was terrible. Um, there's no shared state between actors. That means there's none of that sharing taking place. One actor can't just change a variable out from underneath a different actor, totally separated. Um, messages are delivered between actors asynchronously, meaning actor A just kind of throws a message onto the wire, goes and does its own thing, and message and actor B might pick it up someday, might not. Um, it's often built upon things like threads and shared memory and lots of new texts and all that ugly stuff in the background, but the actor model abstracts that all the way to you. And that's, that's what distinguishes it as a model as opposed to a primitive, um, is that it kind of wraps up all that ugly internal stuff so you don't have to worry about it. Um, the actor model was inspired by Simula and Smalltalk back in the late 60s, and so it's definitely one of those things with a long lineage behind it that's still inspiring new languages in libraries today. Uh, Erlang is a great example of, of a language that implements the actor model really in the course. So, the actor model becomes really even primitive within the language. Um, Erlang's philosophy as a language is really great. The world is concurrent. Things in the world don't share data. Things communicate with messages. Things fail. Model this in a language. Joe R. Armstrong is one of the languages. And so this is just kind of a great ethos. It, it really shows that they are trying to model concepts that humans can understand in a language. Because if we can understand the concepts, it should be easier to write correct programs. Uh, another message passing model is the CSP that I keep talking about, communicating sequential processes. There's this whole math behind the two that I'm not going to touch. Um, but this is what the, the good old transputer was based on internally. Uh, it's similar to actors, very, very similar, except processes are anonymous. Actor, it doesn't have actors with names. Uh, channels are explicit, so instead of having named actors, you have named ways of communicating. Um, and communicating is synchronous. Go takes liberties with this, but the CSP model says when one task communicates with another task, that first task just waits until the second task picks it up. And so you can kind of prove what's going on in that sort of system. Um, invention 78, once again, because everything was invented before the 80s. Uh, and uh, it influenced Limbo, which was a language that created Go, and has heavily influenced Go today. So threads share memory. This is kind of the source of their big conspiracy, uh, or not conspiracy, uh, controversy. I don't know. People get really worked up about how evil threads are. Um, threads, though, this is, this is a great quote. Threads are not or threads as a model of computation are wildly non-deterministic, right? They can just run at any time, they can change variables out from, uh, from underneath one another. You can't mentally reason about their behavior really. And the job of the programmer becomes one of pruning that non-determinism. Meaning to reason about it, you have to start throwing locks in there all over the place, communicate over cues, and you're just doing a lot of this overhead to kind of make threads safe. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make is it's that threading isn't a model. It's not that threads are bad or evil. It's that trying to use them as a high-level programming model for concurrency is just way more complexity than you have to deal with. Threads are primitive. You should be using design patterns and models that just abstract away the threads in the background. Um, build concurrency models on top of threads so you can have the best of both worlds, meaning the, uh, the preemption using all your cores on your CPU, of uh, threads, um, while at the same time having much safer uh, models to work with. So a modern framework that does just this is Akka. Uh, it's event-driven, um, it has an actor model with lightweight processes that it schedules onto operating system threads like Erlang and Go. Um, it also has this software transactional memory thing that hopefully I'll have time to get to here in a minute. Uh, it's also distributed, meaning they can run across multiple machines, and it's all on the JVM. And so this is a great example of, you know, taking uh, um, a language that doesn't have cooperation really built in, Java, uh, and 
and uh, Scala is it's written in as well, but, but adding these features on top of good old threads and queues and things and building up this very high level, safe to work with uh, API and one. So the three concurrency concepts just in review, you know, there's primitives, there's preemption versus cooperation, and then we talked about shared memory versus message passing. So where does that leave us with concurrency today? Uh, so in Java, Python, Ruby, modern C++ world, um, these are all preemptive by default. They, they have threading APIs, you can spin up a thread anytime you want, uh, they can share memory, get yourself into huge messes and fight locks all day, every day. Um, there's a global lock in the, the main implementations of Python and Ruby that kind of prevent very much parallelism from taking place. But it's absolutely concurrent code that you can write by default in those languages. And that's the main concern today. Um, there's lots of lots and lots of higher level design patterns and models for Java. That's kind of what Java's built to do is create abstractions. So it's it's got all the options you could ever want for models on top of this. Um, and there's lots of cooperative libraries for all of these languages, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, fibers and Ruby and Greenlit and Green Threads and Python. Um, there's even various Green Thread libraries in Java. Uh, C++ is kind of interesting. Um, C and C++ don't really have any concurrency built into the libraries. They're very rudimentary sorts of languages and just kind of relied on the operating system system calls to provide these low-level concurrency APIs up until C++ 0x whatever they version their things crazy. Um, but up until the 2000s, uh, C++ didn't really have anything baked into the language. It just left it up to the operating system. C Sharp, at first glance, is a lot like Java. You can spin up threads, share variables, create a huge mess if you want. But it has this async await, these keywords built into it, to add a, a much more cooperative model very natively. And it was really interesting because this was added in 2013, like a decade after, or 14, 15 years after I didn't see Sharp Series appear. And so this is a cool example of being able to really bolt on some more sophisticated concurrency features onto a language long after it was first created. Uh, D, similar to Java at first once again, it's been a thread, it's great mess, but the standard library uh, has built in fibers and tasks and message passing between tasks. So it's still pretty low level. There's nothing super high level and easy to use, but uh, they definitely give you options to not shoot yourself in the foot. JavaScript is Dart, like I said, are cooperative only. There's no preemption. Uh, Dart, though, does offer you tasks and message passing between tasks. So you can model concurrency in a much uh, higher level way than just managing callbacks and callbacks and callbacks. Uh, JavaScript is also getting generators soon. Um, which can kind of, as we discussed, be used as a cooperative concurrency model because of a form of coroutines. Python has tried to use generators for concurrency for about 10 years now. It's really awkward. They're trying again. It's really awkward. Your code is just ugly. There's these yield keywords all over and these, they don't make sense. So I, I don't hold out a lot of points that generators are ever going to be a natural way to model, uh, to model concurrency. They're, they're great at, at uh, some things, but as an overall model of concurrency, they're really popular. Um, Go, I think we talked about plenty. Uh, Rust is super interesting. And this, this video in particular, I highly recommend to anyone uh, interested in memory safety and compiler technology. Um, way outside of my area of expertise. But uh, like I said, pluggable concurrency libraries, which is interesting, but more importantly, safe memory sharing with ownership tracking. And so it, uh, I was talking with some guys earlier about like the compilers yelling at me about making variables mutable or immutable as needed, and I'm trying to make Rust happy. And it's kind of tricky, but the, it's great because the compiler can prove when you're doing safe things in the language. Um, it's really mind-blowing stuff because it really makes uh, threads and the whole framework model totally safe. You don't have to worry about all of these low-level synchronization things um, if you can prove all along the way that you're properly, safely sharing that memory. Julia and Erlang, like I said, just immensely powerful languages, just really sophisticated parallelism, 
uh, concurrency primitives, you can write over languages. That you can just do distributed computing out of the box. Uh, really interesting languages to look at if you're interested in this sort of thing. Uh, Haskell enclosure, I don't know that well, but Haskell, it, it can do anything. It just, it has it all. Um, closure is kind of following close behind. Uh, really cool languages if you can do functional languages. I can sadly cannot. Um, really quickly here, uh, before I open up for questions, um, I do want to cover, we finally have something invented in the 80s. I, I saved one last thing for the end. So this is, this is the new thing in concurrency. I mean, the theory was around in 1986 instead of 1976. Um, it didn't make it into software until the mid-90s. And it didn't really make it into usable software until probably a few years ago. Uh, but software transactional memory is really interesting. If you used a transactional database before, that's what this is doing with your memory. So any of your variables in your program, uh, if you use software transactional memory around them, it has this whole um, commit sort of rollback semantics to all of the changes you make in memory. Uh, or maybe not all. It's often quite configurable which, which uh, changes you want to use transactional memory for. But the idea being is uh, you can actually share things safely and the uh, runtime will actually make sure um, that changes are applied correctly. Uh, super sophisticated stuff, super interesting. There's obviously a performance penalty. The big thing that worries me about it is it, is it kind of encourages this, this bad form, right? It kind of encourages sharing, just sharing memory and writing to it whenever you want. And at the end of the day, even if we make that safe, it's still hard to reason. Uh, and so that's my main concern with software transactional memory, is that at the end of the day, safety is great, but what's even better than that is us human beings to know what's going on, so we can look at a piece of code and debug it and maintain it and improve it. Um, so I don't know, this will be interesting to watch. Uh, Clojure, Scala, Haskell, all have it today. Uh, the PyPy implementation of, the Py of Python um, has some really interesting improved concept stuff being worked on. Uh, which could be exciting there as it would allow parallelism within Python. Uh, yeah, so that's fun. But in general, the future of concurrency uh, is mainly we're just going to keep seeing more and more of these sophisticated models, like actor models, CSP, um, probably STM, uh, but become primitives within new languages. That's what we've seen with Go, and with Dart, and with Rust. Um, they've really taken some really complex, sophisticated ideas just baked them right into the language. And that's super encouraging because that makes them much more readily available. You don't have this fragmentation issue of, well, I'm a Python programmer, this other guy's a Python programmer, but he uses greenlets and I use threads, and so we can't use each other's code, we might as well be in two different languages. Um, it, it totally, uh, so having those built into languages I think is really gonna be beneficial. STM might be interesting, we'll see. Um, and also one kind of cool thing that I didn't get to go into earlier uh, is, is we may need to get new threading system calls in Linux at least that would allow the, your program to have a lot more to say about how threads are scheduled. And so it's this really bizarre new world of like not really cooperative, not really preemptive kind of hybrid scheduling where applications can hint to the kernel, um, well, okay, this thread ran on core one, and I bet it has some data in that course cache that this other thread is going to want to use next. So switch to that other thread so we can keep using the cache data right next to the CPU instead of having to go back to main memory and update caches and get all ugly. It's really crazy sophisticated stuff. I'll have to dig up the, I'll, uh, yeah, I think my notes have the link to the presentation on it. But there is really interesting work being done. Um, even at the, the operating system level, uh, where we haven't really seen much. Um, so, I know that was a lot of information. So thank you for coming and letting me throw that at you. I would love to field questions. Um, I, well, I'm definitely going to be hanging out tonight, so I'd love to chat about your favorite toy language, library, project, whatever that has to do with concurrency. But right now, is there anything that anybody, uh, any questions or mistakes? Yes. Uh, 
Maybe look much at the concurrency across nodes rather than just on uh, a single node. Like the, the constructs, the way they uh, differ when you're talking about the, the like the cache miss on the core is yeah. even more expensive than when all the data has to go off. Yeah. Distributed. Yeah. So that's going back to the this is not a distributed computing talk slide. I'd love to talk about it endlessly, but that's that's a lot of other talks right there. Um, Julia and Erlang are the two languages that come to mind that bake that into the core of the distributed computing aspect. And I don't really know how much they surface around the, uh, the aspects of, you know, networks are slow and long. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a big, big open-ended question. I think that's all I can say with five minutes left. Yes? Yeah, I kind of, um, I felt that maybe you should have added that so you don't hold process preemption. Yeah. You have to have hardware support for it, otherwise you can't implement it properly. Uh -huh. and, and that's a big difference between uh, preemption, the preemption kernels and say high level concurrencies like uh, you know uh, coroutines. Uh, those things don't specifically rely on hardware support. They can, but they don't necessarily have to. So there's a, there's a, there's a so they're not exactly at the same level, you know, like preemptive kernels right. and the higher level constructs are slightly uh, at a slightly higher level of abstraction. That's that is an excellent point. Um and I, I, I think it, it I forgot to mention too that this is not the only way to break down concurrency. There are kind of completely other ways of thinking about it. So the things that I presented are, are one way of classifying these different technologies and talking about it. But yeah, exactly like you said, uh, cooperation and preemption aren't this like black and white, 100% one or the other, or even like equivalent at their place in the stack. You can have preemption at the hardware level or cooperation at the hardware level, but your runtime or libraries might be doing something totally different on top of it. So it's, it's complicated. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, thanks again. <laughs>